Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be doing another Kahoot and we're going to be covering neurological disorders. To be specific, we're going to be going over drugs that treat neurological disorders. This is going to be part two of a multi-part series going over drugs that treat neurological disorders. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now. Don't forget. Go ahead, give me that thumbs up now. You're going to love it. Subscribe to my channel if you have done so already. And be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can find plenty of resources. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Now, without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Pharmacology, Neurological System, Part 2. First question. All right, you're going to give the medication mannitol. Your patient has increased intracranial pressure. What is going to be your priority nursing intervention? Is it to monitor ABGs? Is it to withhold if the blood pressure is less than 90 over 60? Is it to confirm the cardiac status on the telemonitor? Or would it be to use a filtered needle to administer with the filtered needle? Again, you're about to give mannitol because your patient has ICP. What is going to be your priority nursing intervention? Monitor ABGs, withhold if the blood pressure is less than 90 over 60, confirm cardiac status via tele, or administer with a filtered needle. Very good. For the four people that chose the correct answer, are you guys kidding me? Okay, so listen. You have to know mannitol, guys. You have to know this drug. It is an osmotic uh, diuretic, so it helps lower ICP, intracranial pressure. However, this drug tends to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, crystallize, okay? Now imagine you don't use a filter needle when you're pulling that drug out. You're going to mess around and cause that patient to have a pulmonary embolism or or a stroke, or organ damage. So many things can happen from the crystallization of that medication just because you as a nurse forgot to use a filtered needle. Then you're standing before the board of nursing trying to defend your license, right? So when it comes to mannitol, that's very important for you to know. You need to know that you have to use a filtered needle when um, withdrawing that, um, that uh, um, solution. All right, which patient teaching about fentanyl is correct? Is it if your urine turns brown, call the healthcare provider right away. You should take this drug on an empty stomach. You need to switch to a soft bristle toothbrush or you may get a sore throat while taking this medication. Very good. You're going to teach them about using a soft bristle toothbrush. So this medication, which is Dilantin, it's an anti-epileptic uh, agent, anti-seizure drug. But one of the things that it's known to cause um, is uh, gingival hyperplasia. So you're going to teach the patient to use a soft bristle toothbrush. Now, yes, this drug can turn your urine brown or like a reddish brown uh, color, but that's a side effect and it's harmless. Well, Professor D, it's a side effect. Let me tell you what the difference between side effect and adverse effect is. We use it interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. A side effect are things that may happen, but the healthcare provider is not going to change the patient's dosage or medication if it happens. But you do have to warn the patient. We don't want it to take it. We don't want it to take them by surprise because they'll stop taking the medication. But nothing's really going to change. We just let them know. So um, their urine changing either like a red, reddish color or reddish brownish color, that's a side effect. It's something that can happen. We're going to warn them, but it's not something that we expect their drug, their uh, dosage to change, right? You should take this drug on an empty stomach. 
Well, no, this medication is very hard on the stomach and cause GI issues. So you're going to teach them to take this drug with food. And the last one, you may get a sore throat while taking this medication. Let me tell you why this one was tricky. Because it is possible you may get a sore throat. You may get a fever. But when you say, oh, you may get a sore throat when you take this medication, it sounds as if you it may happen like this is a side effect, but it's fine. No, it's not. You tell them if you get a sore throat, you get a fever, any symptom of infection, you need to let us know right away. Okay, that is an adverse effect. You let us know right away because most likely what's going to happen, the healthcare provider is either going to change your drug, change the dosage, something is going to be changed. That is an adverse effect, okay? All right. True or false? Evening primrose lowers the seizure threshold. Is this true or is this false? You guys are split on the live. Wow. It's true, guys. It is absolutely true. And so um, when, this, uh, when the patient is on uh, anti-seizure drug, you have to ask that patient what over-the-counter drugs are they taking, over-the-counter meds, what um, herbs are they taking, because evening primrose absolutely does lower the seizure threshold, and it places that patient at a higher risk for getting seizures or going into a seizure, okay? Okay, the code to get in is 195218. Everyone that's on the live right now, can you do me a favor, please? Just type that code for the newcomers, 195218. Just type that on the live for me, please. 195218. Thank you. All right, which drug is contraindicated in anyone that has high risk factors for stroke? Propanolol, furosemide, orthocycline, or metformin. Which drug would be contraindicated in anyone that has high risk factors for stroke? Which drug would we not under any circumstances give, e even if it's ordered, you're gonna tell that healthcare provider to come down and give it themselves because you are not about to lose your license, right? What drug are you not going to give if you see that that patient has high, uh, high risk factors for stroke? Would it be propanolol, furosemide, orthocycline, or metformin? Very good, orthocycline. Um, this uh, hormone replacement itself puts you at high risk for stroke. Very, very high risk for stroke, DVTs, we're not even playing those type of games. Okay, propanolol, you guys know that's a beta blocker, brings down blood pressure, furosemide, uh, that's a diuretic agent, brings down a decreases of fluid in the body, and then metformin is an oral anti-diabetic agent. Why? I don't know the action that causes, like the, the chemical reaction in the body that causes the patient to be at high risk for stroke. I couldn't even tell you. Like, I'm sure if I read it somewhere, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's true. I just don't remember. Um, but what you do need to know, let me tell you how bad it is. No practitioner in their right mind will prescribe this to a patient that's a smoker because a smoking, that's already a high risk for stroke, right? No one's trying to lose their license. All right. Uh, your patient is diagnosed with a brain tumor. Which drug order would you expect? Cyclophosphamide, octreotide, erythropoietin, or fentoin? Which one would you um, expect to be ordered?
very good on those that went with the fentanyl and the dilantin. And it makes sense because if that patient has a brain uh, tumor, they're at high risk for what? Seizures. And we know this is an anti-seizure drug. Very good. All right. Which of the following drugs are known for treating Parkinson's disease? Carbidopa, levodopa, donepazil, lithium, or sumatriptan? Which of the following drugs are known for treating Parkinson's disease? Guys, the contest is almost over. I know you guys are sick of me, but if you haven't voted for Matthew yet, please go on my page and vote for him. The voting is free. It costs you nothing. Please take five seconds and go vote for him, please. Very good. Carbidopa, levodopa. So you guys know Parkinson's disease. That's the disorder where the patient's... Um, They have the tremble, trembling um, extremities at rest, the shuffling gait. Now, the problem with Parkinson's is a lack of what? What is low? And that's basically why the patient has uh, Parkinson's. Can you guys tell? Very good. Lack of dopamine. So a great drug, the number one drug on the market for treating that is going to be the levodopa, carbidopa, because what they're lacking is dopamine. You need to know that. That question is on HESI, NCLEX, and ATI. Don't say I didn't warn you. Um, when you think of Parkinson's, think of those trap symptoms, T-R-A-P-T, -T, those tremors at rest, even at rest, R, rigidity, the muscle rigidity, A, akinesia, either them not moving or the slow moving. That's why in, you're going to teach the patient. Well, let me not get to that yet. And then P is for postural instability, because instead of standing up straight, they're like this, right? When you're walking, but you're looking down, guess what? Your center of gravity is going to shift and you get dizzy and fall. Okay, you're going to teach that patient, you know, because there are big fall risks when it comes to Parkinson's, you're going to teach them to pretend like there's a line on the floor, and they have to step over that line. So instead of the shuffling feet, it has to force them to lift their legs, one in front of the other in order to walk. 195218, that's the code to get in, 195218. True or false? The combination of levodopa with vitamin B6 or fentanyl increased levodopa effectiveness. Is this true or is this false? The, combina the combination of levodopa with B6 or fentanyl increases the levodopa effectiveness. Is this true or is this false? No idea is not an option. We're covering drugs that treat neurological disorders. Very good. That's false. It is contraindicated to give B6 or fentanyl in the patient that's getting levodopa. It decreases the effectiveness. So we avoid, so if, if you've been ordered to give B6 or a fentanyl to a patient that is already on levodopa, you're not going to just give the drug because it was ordered. No, you're going to use critical thinking. You're going to uh, withhold that drug and call the healthcare provider and say, hey, did you know this patient's on this drug? And most of the time you get, oh, I didn't know. Thanks. And um, their drug regimen will be um, augmented. All right, select all that applies. What are the adverse effects associated with dopaminergic drugs? Select all that apply. Here are your options. By the way, if you're new to my channel or new to me, I, I preach this every single time. The key to answering select all that applies correct is treating them as true or false. Don't try to group the answers together. Each option, is it true or is this false? So the question's asking about Uh, adverse effects associated with dopaminergic drugs. Here are your options. Increased heart rate, decreased heart rate. Increased blood pressure, decreased blood pressure. Polyuria, urinary retention. 
which ones are adverse effects associated with dopaminergic drugs? All right, so let's talk about it. Increased heart rate, that is an adverse effect. Increased blood pressure, that is an adverse effect. But not polyuria, not increased urination. It's actually decreased urination. So what happens is urinary retention. Those three we see as adverse effects with dopaminergic drugs. True or false? Anticholinergic agents are used to treat Parkinson's disease. Is this true or is this false? Anticholinergic agents are used to treat Parkinson's disease. True or false? True. Uh, these drugs are used as adjunct drugs, and they're also they're used as adjunct drugs. They're used adjunct drugs for Parkinson's. They're also used um, to treat the extrapyramidal symptoms we see uh, with the disorder. And what's the third thing I was going to tell you about anticholinergic? Oh, and they're used after after a patient's been on. Um, Levodopa for a certain amount of time, very often their body just does not respond to it anymore. And so when that happens, anticholinergic agents will also be um, uh, prescribed for that patient. Those three things that I mentioned, make sure you know that for anticholinergic agents in regards to Parkinson's disease. Select all that apply. What are the adverse effects of anticholinergic agents that the patient should be instructed on? If you've been following me for any amount of time, you, and you're you saying that poem right now. You, know, you already know the answer. Here are your options. Xerostomia, urinary retention, blurred vision, constipation, photophobia, nausea, and vomiting. What adverse effects of anticholinergic agents that the patient, um, what are the adverse effects of anticholinergic agents that the patient should be instructed about? I see you, Bree Bree. Finish the poem. That's the first part. Very good, Cassidy. All of them. Anticholinergics can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't can't see blurred vision, can't spit, dry mouth, xerostomia, can't pee, urinary retention, can't constipation. Also, this patient may experience photophobia, uh, um, uh, sensitivity to light, and nausea vomiting. Guess what? Everything causes nausea vomiting. Everything causes nausea vomiting. Dry mouth. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's it, guys. There were just uh, 10 slides. So let's see how you guys did. And then I'll get back to you guys on the live. Let's see how you did.